Dr. B.F. Skinner, professor of psychology at Harvard University, has authored such important scientific books as The Behavior of Organisms, Verbal Behavior, The Technology of Teaching, and Contingencies of Reinforcement. In addition, he has written two books of general interest which have been both widely received and highly controversial, the novel Walden II and Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Included in the many scientific awards bestowed upon him are the Distinguished Scientific Award of the American Psychological Association, membership in the National Academy of Sciences, and the President's Medal of Science. In this film, Dr. Skinner addresses himself to some of the most important issues facing education today. As we join Dr. Skinner and Dr. John M. Whiteley of Washington University, they are discussing what dimensions of human endeavor are not receiving sufficient attention in schools. We certainly are ignoring many of the important aspects of our own culture in our present education. We're having so much trouble teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic that we don't prepare students to enjoy their lives. Uh, we boast of the fact that uh, with our industrialization and so on, we're now giving people a great deal of leisure time. We cut the week down first to five days, and now they're talking about four days. We cut down the work hours. What are we going to do with, with all of this time which is suddenly being released in which people don't have to do anything? The, what, if you don't watch out, what, what you will do are those things which are immediately gratifying and reinforcing. All leisure cultures have tended to go in for, for drunkenness or drug addiction for spectatorship, the Roman circus, that kind of thing, watching other people living dangerously, uh, gambling of all sorts, games of chance, and that. These are, the, these are the things that people are likely to do when they don't have to do anything. Now, the trouble with that is that by the end of a full lifetime of exposure to this, you are no better off than you were. You can, you can buy a lottery ticket every week of your life, and at the end of your life, you, you're the same person you were when you started. You can, say, you can stay stoned or drunk all your life, and um, you've not acquired any new kinds of behavior at all. Watching other people live seriously or dangerously doesn't, doesn't do that either. Now, if, if you leave it to the individual, those are the things he is likely to do. But the culture, through its educational facilities primarily, can, pro can teach people other kinds of, of reinforcements, other things that they can do to be reinforced, which actually will bring out all that there is in them. They can develop arts, skills, talents of that sort, where by the end of your life you are a very different person. You are now an accomplished musician or an accomplished artist, or you're an accomplished listener to music, so you get more out of it than you ever did before. Or you read, not simply in the sense of living somebody else's life in a novel, but be more perceptive about people, understanding people better, and so on. These, these are the kinds of things that people could also do with leisure time, which would make them much more effective people. And, but they need, they need support from the culture. They're not the thing that people naturally do, mm -hmm. because they, they are more deferred by way of consequences. You need to prepare a person well, to does, be musical. How does an educational system help develop people? in this way? Well, it would have to arrange temporary reinforcers to build the kinds of behaviors which eventually prove to be more highly reinforcing. If I sit and watch professional football on a Saturday afternoon, I get something very quick out of that. If, however, I, in, instead of that, I, I practice the piano or something like that so that then on I'm slightly more effective as a player, then I have done something which will, will increase my pleasure for the rest of my life, perhaps, whereas the football game comes to an end, it's all over, and that's that. I may have bet on it or something of that sort, so I've been terribly interested in how it comes out. I've had a good two or three hours um, by, by way of immediate gratification, but I'm, at the end, I'm, I'm back where I started from at the beginning. But if I do something which uh, increases my skill or my general understanding of things or my knowledge, then I am in a position to do something different the next time, which will, at the end of my life, I will be 
as complete a person as I could possibly be. What are some of the temporary reinforcers that those in education can use to foster this kind of constructive personal development? Clearly, the, the deck is stacked on the other side. Uh, Long-range behavior is much more difficult to develop yes. than short-range behavior. It's also not a seemingly as amenable to short-term adversive control that educational systems use so much. What can they substitute, and how can they begin? Yes. Well, this is, again, one of those practical problems of finding out what a particular person finds reinforcing. But if you take the, uh, the old pattern of learning to play the piano, in every neighborhood in my day there was a, there was a teacher of the piano, and she had pupils, and she, or he, in my case, I was, actually was a man who, who taught me the piano very briefly. And he would call once a week our house and I would sit down and play the morning prayer by someone named Striabog. His name was Gobers, but he reversed it and for very good reason, but I'm sure he wouldn't would be proud of having composed this piece of music. And uh, I would be jabbed in the ribs if I made a mistake and so on. And I practiced this, I hated it, and gave it up as quickly as my parents would allow me to. And this is a fairly common pattern. One thing, you've got to play perfectly because there's going to be a spring recital that all the students get together and play this kind of thing. No, nothing could be done to make people less mm -hmm. interested in making music. Now, there are natural reinforcers in the field of music and all sorts of noisy things that kids love to bang on and mm -hmm. so on. And I'm sure that you could build a kind of kindergarten of music in which kids would have a, a lot of fun making noises and you could program it in such a way that they would be have, they have to make more and more complicated noises. You see this with kids getting rhythms and so on. They're, they are reinforcing themselves. It's, it, the, and, and the, the rhythms are, are reinforcing. And these things grow. You become better and better at this. But I would think also you might want to have, um, well, for, for, for one thing, you'd want to program the material in such a way that progress is pretty conspicuous. And not just finishing one piece every year for a spring recital, but actually quite clearly doing much more with your music than you had ever done before. Let's take another example, reading, which is both a basic goal yes. of schools and something that in terms of the increased leisure life that people may have a great deal of satisfaction is to be had from reading. Yet our statistics show that the average American reads no books a year, yes. the consequence of 12 or 13 years of education has been no interest in reading books. Right. Or the average college graduate reads something like 0.7 books a year. And there's no indication of what kind of books those are anyway. Given these kinds of figures, it doesn't appear with a massive effort being made in our educational system to teach reading that people are reading very much at all. How might you begin to do this? This is a goal that almost everybody in our society would value. How well have they learned to read, you see? If you don't read very well, if you've got to figure out words and whatnot, then it's not pleasurable to read a book, and you stay away from it. You ought to learn, at a very early age, I think, to read fluently and in ways which don't wear out your larynx when you're reading silently to yourself and permit you then to, to get the, the pleasurable side of, of, of books. We have tended to get away from uh, an emphasis on, on verbal behavior as such. People do read the comics, they read what is in the balloons, mm -hmm. uh, and that's enough because the picture tells them the rest. Or they, they subscribe to magazines which have pictures and very little text. And the pictures are doing the, doing most of the work. Or they watch TV with no printed material to read. So you can say, well, we're getting away from reading. But I think that's true either. I think that actually a great deal of our thinking is verbal. And if we fall back entirely on visual and other presentations, we are be, we'll be doing less and less thinking all the time and solving problems and that sort of thing. I, I think the problem, the trouble is, not that we haven't spent a lot of effort in teaching reading, but we've done so very badly. In the old days, when the punitive systems were feasible, you learned to read or else, I mean, that kind of thing, and, and uh, people did learn to read, and many of them uh, read a great deal and, and enjoyably. But uh, by relaxing the punitive continuum,